Aloha, I'm Malia Zimmerman and this is News Behind the News. I am looking forward today to a conversation with two very interesting gentlemen, two community leaders who have made a big difference in our uh, town in Hawaii. And um, the first is uh, Samuel Judge King and he is a district court judge and we also have Professor Randall Roth who is a uh, professor of law at the University of Hawaii. They both authored a book called The Broken Trust and we're going to be talking more about that Broken Trust book today and what led up to this runaway bestseller and also how it's been reviewed across the mainland and how they uh, got involved with writing this book and also what led up to the essay that they also wrote, the very well-known essay called The Broken Trust. So I want to welcome you both, and thank you for coming today. Thank you. So maybe you can tell us about your book, The Broken Trust. Well, <clears throat> the book is named, it carries the name forward from the article that was printed in the Star Bulletin, which kind of brought to a boil what was going on at the Kamehameha schools at that time. And uh, other Hawaiians were involved. Uh, Walter Heen, Monsignor Kekamanu, and Gladys Brandt. Bless Gladys Brandt. When we got all through, and Randy can tell us about how we uh, collected all the materials, both Gladys Brandt and Monsignor Kekamanu, who unfortunately has since passed away, and to whom the book is dedicated, thought that it should be written up. And uh, who was going to do the work? Well, the young, youngest fellow was well, <laughs> Randy Roth. And he's the one who got us all involved in the first place. So Randy, you want to tell him? Um, David Shapiro, who wrote the introduction for the book Broken Trust, said that what was in that essay was important and it had its own power. But what really did what the essay was all about what really gave it its power uh, was the stature of its authors. Well, actually, he said the stature of four of its authors, and I'm author number five. Um, as Judge King had indicated, at the time, there was a great deal of turmoil. Um, a lot of alumni and others who cared deeply about Princess Pauahi's legacy were so upset that they had uh, staged a very dramatic march on Kauaiaha Plaza. And the five of us viewed uh, our Broken Trust essay as something that would support their efforts. Um, I, at the time, had a radio show called Hawaii, or Price of Paradise on Hawaii Public Radio. Yeah. And I was writing an essay that would appear in the Sunday morning advertiser, as was the uh, normal process of having uh, an essay that would uh, tie in with what was on the radio show. And I took to Judge King what I had written thus far. It was very rough. And I asked him for his thoughts on it. Uh, Judge King, you want to tell Malia what <laughs> advice you gave me? <clears throat> when Randy came up with this article, which was a thesis of broken trust, I said, well, the first thing that's happening is you're going to paint a mark on your back for people who want to shoot at you. And uh, next is you're not going to get anywhere as a Howley who's writing about what the Hawaiians ought to do. So uh, Randy said, well, will, will you go signing it with me? Well, we, we tell that story in the book. I said, if my wife says, OK. And um, he also then got to Gladys Brandt. She said, if Sam King's with you, so am I. She got Monsu Kekamonu, who always does what Gladys tells him to do. And uh, Walter Heen came in because he was trying to find some way to help and uh, offered himself. So that's the genesis of the people who wrote this. And the broken trust refers to the Hawaiian people. So that the book begins almost halfway through before you get to the thing with the, how Hawaiians were being treated in Hawaii up to that time. And Gladys Brandt used to say she was prevented from speaking Hawaiian. She thought Hawaiian was junk. Um, I didn't run into too much of that myself, but many Hawaiians had the same experience. 
And Randy picked up from that and made it something that we could look over, talk over, and put together. He's a back rat. He had every piece of information you needed. All of all the newspaper articles, all the speeches that were made, all the uh, marches that the students had done and the teachers had done. Tell us about that, Randy. <laughs> How many documents did you have? Uh, I probably have uh, a million pages of, wow. of documents and uh, hundreds of uh, interviews that were taken during the various investigations. Um, interviewed hundreds of people and, and everything was uh, transcribed. And so in, in preparing for the Broken Trust essay and then later for the Broken Trust book, there's been a tremendous amount of, um, of research done. And a couple of people have commented on the fact that we don't have footnotes in the book, but we've explained that we have a website, brokentrustbook.com. And if people will go to that website, they can find source documents and just a wealth of other information that people interested in the story, uh, I think, would enjoy taking a look at. Well, you quote so many people, too. So the, the people are actually say, telling their part of the story as well. You, you quote people and tell about people. So besides that, you also, the book speaks for itself, I think, without that. Well, but that's good that you offer that. Many of these uh, quotes come from people who testified mm -hmm. in, in the suit against uh, uh, our friend uh, Loki Lani. Loki Lani. Loki Lani. So Lindsay, there were, who was a there trustee, were public right? statements. Right. And Nona Bima had written a letter which was printed in the papers. And others had uh, made no bones about what they said. So quoting them was no problem. Uh, others didn't want to be quoted, but we knew what they'd said. So we knew the circumstances and we didn't have to quote them to, to define the circumstances. So for people that didn't, you know, either weren't in Hawaii or didn't get to follow this whole um, saga of what happened at the Bishop Estate Kamehameha Schools, can you sum up for them what exactly happened um, in, in terms of, you know, the corruption that was uncovered at the school, what led up to the changes, and maybe, maybe give some background on that? <clears throat> Let me give you a short quote from an English, Englishman. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's true. Uh, Randy, Randy found it all. Um, at the time the alumni and others staged this dramatic march, uh, there were some very uh, obvious breaches of trust, serious breaches of trust. And this is at Kamehameha School with the trustees that were there? Yes. One of the trustees in particular, Lokilani Lindsay, was on campus and had a very negative effect on campus, and that's what got the teachers and a lot of the students and their parents upset. But as Judge King and I and Walter Heen, the lawyers in our group, could see, there were a number of problems in the judiciary that were related <coughs> to the problems at Bishop Estate, and there were some very serious legal problems that I don't think uh, most people saw. And what Broken Trust, the essay, did was to explain in terms that non-lawyers could understand that somebody needed to take a very, very close look at what those trustees were doing. Uh, up until that time, the political wind was such that uh, no attorney general, no governor, no court-appointed master was saying anything negative about the Bishop State trustees. Because nobody dared do that. Well, they were there so had powerful. been some newspaper articles mm -hmm. uh, by Memminger, and others. Charles Memminger of the Star Bulletin. Yes, but yep. nothing happened. <laughs> right, right. So <laughs> and nothing, nobody dug too deep, right? They were starting to dig deep, That's but right. then there was yeah. a limit to what they could do. Reporters, it was, it right? It was not only a story of, of um, breaches of trust, but of Hawaiians finding their own way. For the first time, the Hawaiian community acted as a large group when they had the march. Prior to that time, uh, if you said something nasty about couldn't they have schools or the trustees, they'd all come out with placards, which just happened to be printed, you know, with all the messages on it. Pre-printed, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But this time, they they went too far. Well, maybe you can describe the march, because people that, that weren't here at that time might, might want to know just how many people and where they marched from, and give a little background on that. Well, there was up to a, a thousand people, 
And the interesting thing was, uh, the inspiring thing, was that they knew that their photographs would be taken. They knew that there would be some form of retaliation, but they felt so strongly that they needed to protect Princess Pauahi's legacy. And these were s some students and teachers and people that were from the Hawaii parents. community, parents? Mostly, alumni, Mostly and, alumni, and some of them getting up in years who just felt so strongly that something had to be done. And it was extremely moving, and that's what got Judge King, Gladys Brandt, Monsignor Kekamano, Walter Heen, and I involved trying to support those efforts. And in our essay, we pointed out many serious ongoing breaches of trust. Up until then, the perception by the politicians was that, that if they criticized the trustees, if they investigated the trustees, uh, that would be perceived in a negative way by the Hawaiian community. But the March and the Broken Trust essay changed all of that to where all of a sudden the wind shifted 180 degrees and the politically smart thing was to call for an investigation, which is what Governor Cayetano did. Uh, his attorney general started her investigation. The court-appointed master uh, said it's a whole new ball game and changed directions and, and intensified his inquiry. There was a court-appointed fact finder. The Campaign Spending Commission got involved. The IRS was involved. So they were literally under siege. There were five different investigations going on at the time. And eventually, and there was a, a world record of breaches of trust that, that came to light, but eventually those five trustees were forced out. Mm -hmm. And there was a perception that everything would be great. Uh, but then, as we explain in the book, uh, there were some extremely disappointing events that occurred following the removal of those five trustees. And um, when people ask us why we've written the book, uh, we always start by citing Gladys Brandt. Uh, Gladys said that we needed to provide a context for the story. Mm -hmm. And so, as Judge King has said, the first half of the book is setting the stage. Plus, it was a historic event. History should be written down for future generations. There were a lot of missing pieces, important information that the media didn't report. But also, there was what we perceived to be a cover-up. There was an attempt to sweep under the rug very important information that never came to light. Well, we've got it in the book, and we think that that was reason enough to uh, write the book. And of course, everything added together translates into helping those who care about Princess Pauahi's legacy to protect it. You can't protect it without information, and we hope the book provides that information. Right, and Princess Pauahi, of course, uh, founded the school, and you know that was and with yes. her husband and, and so on, right? Well, when she wrote the book, she uh, every provision in her will has been violated except the appointment of five trustees. <laughs> so. And you go over that in the book. I know that's yeah. really d in detail. So it's the, an amazing story. There was no story. age requirement for the original trustees. They mm -hmm. served until they resigned or died. Died, and eventually they recommended to the Supreme Court that there be an age requirement. And guess what age they picked? I don't know. Seventy. Seventy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is today. For those right? who have seen what's been going on right, recently, right? Today, right. And how and old? Elections. Seventy. Right. That's a terrible age. Right. 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 And the Supreme Court picked that age. But um, except for, for, for Trustee Richardson, who had to make it 72 for him, but then it went back for 70 for everybody else. When you talk about sweeping under the rug, maybe uh, information under the rug and a cover-up, maybe you can give some examples of that in terms of what do you think wasn't let out that you did get to publish in your book? Well, um, the uh, trustees literally set a world record for breaches of trust in terms of the number of breaches, the seriousness of, of breaches. And when I give talks outside Hawaii to trust lawyers or trust professors or IRS personnel or executives of nonprofit organizations, uh, it's accepted that this literally was a world record for breaches of trust. And yet the five trustees, when they were finally forced out, uh, they didn't have to pay a penny of the millions of dollars that had been recommended that they pay in surcharges. They didn't have to pay a penny of the tens of millions that the IRS had argued were excess benefits that they had received inappropriately from the trust. They didn't have to repay a penny of the millions of dollars of trust funds that had been spent on attorneys that were watching out for their personal interests, and so that should have been paid for by them. Uh, 
Uh, they didn't have to pay a penny of the $200 million in specific damages that the Attorney General's office said their breaches had caused to the trust. And in fact, they didn't even have to admit that they'd done anything wrong. Unbelievable. Well, one, of the <clears throat> one of the problems is that the best information has all been buried. Um, the IRS's report, what do they call it, the 5071? 5701s. <laughs> which goes through everything that they did wrong. When the IRS finally said, we won't deal with those people, they either get off or we're going to cancel Kamehameha Schools um, tax exemption. Um, that report is unavailable. And who has it? Kamehameha Schools has it. So they still haven't re released it to the public, They won't huh? release it to the public. Well, and there are many, many documents that they're not releasing or that the courts have sealed. And, uh, and it's really so disappointing in part because the replacement trustees didn't just have an opportunity to hold the former trustees accountable. They have a fiduciary duty to hold the former trustees accountable. And when I explained to them at the time that, that they couldn't just say for closure and healing purposes they want to look forward, the law required them to hold those former trustees accountable. They said, well, that's not the advice we're getting from our lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's another problem. They were looking for legal advice from lawyers who in many instances had been advising the former trustees, and mm -hmm. therefore those lawyers had a very serious conflict of interest. Plus, they named as their chief officer the individual who had been the chief in-house lawyer for over 10 years, been at the epicenter of what we call a world record for breaches of trust. And you can't put someone like that who has a conflict of interest in control of the flow of information to and from you. And for those and other reasons, the replacement trustees disappointed us very, very much. And again, we describe it as sweeping this under the rug because it should have been aired out. People should have been held accountable not because we wanted it to happen, but because the law requires it. And yet it wasn't done, and the courts and the Attorney General's office reverted back to the old days, where as long as the Hawaiians weren't complaining, then their friends could get away with whatever. One of the things that was more <clears throat> interesting to those of us who are part Hawaiian was the, the way that the Hawaiian community came together to stand up for its own rights. Um, now they seem to be satisfied, <laughs> things, you know, nobody's watching the stables. Right. So, so it still, still gonna, has a lot of cleaning house to do and yeah, the horses the, are gonna there's get not away the again. Uh, momentum that was there before yes. to do so, right? And some very fine people came forward, you know, they knew what was supposed to be done and uh, unfortunately it isn't being done. But you yeah. did make progress. I mean, you did, so for people to oh, know, yes. I mean, what it was before, I mean, just to give people an example that the trustees were getting a million dollars a year or more each. Each. I mean, who's ever heard of a CEO making, I mean, unless you're a part of Enron or something, uh, to have five CEOs of, uh, in essence, getting a million dollars each. Which is a violation of trust law. Violation of trust law. And um, Dr. Uh, Roth, he likes to pretend that uh, he's not uh, anybody important, but he's very important. His background is in a state law, and he's an expert in that. So he's the only one in the state. He, yep, he's the only one in the state, and he knows all about that. So he knew exactly what was going on after it, and he was the perfect person to kind of craft it. And so you, so you did expose that. You exposed also the um, yes. political corruption, where they were using money that was supposed to be for the children, and it was going to political friends in huge amounts and funding political polls and so on, and campaign yeah. donations, right? Ed Case was able to get, get a bill through a legislature, through mm -hmm. the legislature uh, defining the compensation as reasonable. Right. Instead, that wasn't a million dollars a year, right? No. <laughs> well, the IRS thought it wasn't, it wasn't even legal. Right, right. <laughs> so you did make a lot of progress, but there's still a lot more, a lot more to do. And, well, there's so many problems that still exist. Right. We mentioned a few minutes ago that the former trustees really weren't held accountable, that they mm -hmm. didn't have to pay anything out of their own pocket, didn't even have to admit that they'd done anything wrong. 
there was a court-appointed master who had pointed out that there were a number of lawyers and law firms that had behaved badly and that uh, fees, that millions of dollars of fees that had been paid to them should have been gotten back. And the interim trustee spent another million dollars on another legal opinion saying, no, they didn't have to go get the money back from those lawyers, so there wasn't a form of accountability there. Um, the, as you mentioned, there's a lot of evidence that there were many politicians, not just Milton Holt, who had the credit card where he spent 20-some thousand dollars in Las Vegas casinos. That and, was given and, to him by Bishop of State. And yes. local hostess clubs. It was a Bishop of State credit card. Princess Pawahi's legacy being spent in, in strip, strip clubs. Strip clubs. How, uh, how horrible. And, and that was just the tip right. of a very big iceberg. And part of these materials that we've unearthed, that we've put on the brokentrustbook.com website, illustrates that there were dozens of elected officials who were helping themselves to the Kamehameha Schools cookie jar, if you will. There should have been accountability. Uh, there wasn't. Uh, the justices who had initially selected the trustees based on poli uh, political considerations, justices who had a, a fiduciary duty to pick trustees in the best interests of the trust and its beneficiaries, <coughs> and instead, it's pretty easy, I think, to make a case for them having engaged in a form of political payback. Those justices have been given additional terms. Um, there's been no accountability there for their efforts in, in this regard. And in fact, they refused to participate in the investigation. They had said it was okay for them to pick trustees because they were doing it in their unofficial capacity, but then they put their back on their robes and said, well, we're justices, so we don't have to participate in this investigation. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the book, what is probably most powerful, because few people realized um, just how involved the justices were in all of this and just how disappointing their behavior was during the investigation and, and following it, including what we call the smoking gun memo that we discovered, that most people who read the book who comment to us on it begin by saying how disappointed they were in the justices. And again, no accountability whatsoever for what we perceive to be um, poor behavior. What's the smoking gun memo? Remind me. The smoking gun memo had to do with communications between the Chief Justice and the head political operative uh, at Bishop Estate. Okay. And it goes back to 1994. One of my favorite chapters in the book is the black and blue panel. Right. I like that <laughs> chapter too. It was referred to at the time as the Blue Ribbon Panel, right. but Gladys Brandt, who was the chair of that group, uh, later called it the black and blue panel because of the way they had been treated. Uh, very briefly, and people should read that chapter, mm -hmm. uh, very briefly Gladys could see that, that this was a plan to um, give a respectable front to the de decision the justice had already made to name the sitting governor as the next trustee. Mm -hmm. And she volunteered to be the chair, and if you know who Gladys Brandt was, right. you know that everybody said, well, of course. She had them vote immediately on whether somebody could be put on the short list if they didn't have majority support, and that passed. And so when it was time for the governor's name to be added to the list, Gary Rodriguez and others was insisting that it be put there. This is but the former governor, John Y. Hey. Yes. Former Governor John mm -hmm. Y. Hay and Gary Rodriguez was perceived by many to be the most powerful person outside of government at and the he time. Was heading the UPW at the time. Heading right? the UPW no, at the, the time. Now he's he's waiting to to go to prison. But uh, when he realized that he wasn't able to get the governor's name on the list, he threw a tandem. He tore up the papers in front of them. He threw them. And Gladys, who had been his principal at Kapa uh, High School years earlier, said, now, Gary, behave yourself. And he said, I'm tired of being treated like a child. And she said, well, Gary, when you act like a child, you must expect to be treated like a child. <laughs> and he stormed out of the room, called the governor. and. Again, we tell the whole story, and the bottom line is that it was wired to appoint the governor. Gladys almost single-handedly prevented that from happening, so the justices threw out the list completely and appointed the governor's closest associate, Jerry Jervis, who was right. also the sitting who chair was an attorney at the time, right? of the Judicial Selection Commission. Oh, dear. Uh, very political choice. Turned out to be an absolute disaster from the trust standpoint. Right. And, at, and the, at the time, when, they, when there was denial, uh, nobody was interfering. 
uh, one of the uh, people that was on this blue blue ribbon panel was uh, the Walker, who was head of Amfac, wasn't it? And uh, his son told us that he was telling his son what terrific political pressure there was on him and others. To appoint John Wahei. Put Wahei's name right, on there. Right, right. And in fact, we tell the story of when Gladys took the list to the justices. There was a separate list and a separate envelope for each of the justices. And she said that they opened their individual envelopes, each looked at the list, and there was dead silence for the longest time. And then one of them said, where's his name? Mm. And she knew exactly who they were talking about. Again, it was wired. And um, that's the way it functioned in those days. And we're fearful that it will be that way in the future. If, if five <coughs> justices of the Supreme Court couldn't withstand the political pressure, and we believe they didn't, we wonder why anyone would assume that one probate judge who's appointed by the Chief Justice, why that judge would be assumed to be able to withstand the political pressure. So we think there are a number of issues right now, and one of them is the trustee selection is, uh, is flawed. I think one of the most important things in this story is the enabling of the Hawaiians who now know what they can do. Mm -hmm. And we'll do it again if they get crossed. <laughs> In fact, one of my favorite parts of the book is the afterword, where Jan Dill basically says that, only he says it much more eloquently than, than I could. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a very quick 27 minutes um, that we've had just now together, and we're actually going to do another show, another 20 minute, uh, 7 minute show, right after this, so that people can see uh, the news behind the news continued, and we can learn more about the Broken Trust book and the Broken Trust essay. For those people that can't tune in, I wanted to let you know that all the proceeds from this book are going to charity, so they're not actually making any money from this book, and uh, they're donating all of it uh, back to the children of Hawaii. And so I encourage you uh, to go out and get a copy and give one to everyone you know. The Broken Trust book and also the brokentrustbook.com website. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to more conversations with Dr. Roth and Judge King. I'm Malia Zimmerman with News Behind the News. Aloha. Aloha.